All right, everyone. Welcome back for a, another dose of Joint School. Today, it is my great honor, privilege, and pleasure to introduce Professor Philip Turner, who will be joining us for this session. Now, Professor Turner is a very experienced orthopedic knee surgeon. He has been a consultant at Stepping Hill since 1990 and specializes in all aspects of knee surgery. Uh, he has performed thousands of operations, and among them, you will find elite athletes in football, rugby, and people we've seen in the Olympics. Uh, and Professor Turner was also recently the president of the British Orthopedic Association from 2018 to 2019, and remains there as a council and executive member, and is involved in much more besides. But without further ado, Professor Turner, thank you for joining us. Right. Hi, Axel. Thanks very much for inviting me to do this as well. Oh, it's an, it's an absolute pleasure to, to, to have you with us. Um, you know, when, when, with, with these sessions, what we often do is to sort of connect with, uh, with, with people who have a great, great wealth of experience of this topic and, and really just to sort of see what are the conversations that you would normally be having with, with, with your patients in clinic. And then, of course, here in this medium, we have a little bit more time. We can... We can, we, we, we can give things a little, you know, give the, the conversation a little bit more space, but of course also bearing in mind that nothing we discuss here is personalized medical advice. And to anyone watching this, ultimately, you know, it's all going to be about the conversations that you have with your surgeon and the healthcare team looking after you. But hopefully what we'll be talking about here today will be a nice compliment to those conversations. Okay, all makes sense, Axel. Looking forward to it. Ask, <laughs> ask me the questions. <laughs> I will indeed. So, 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 so the, the questions that we'll go through. So, it's sort of some of the top three questions that uh, you know from from speaking with you that you encounter in in clinic with with patients, and that, and that people want to know when they come to you, uh, specifically if they are have been told that they need a knee replacement, they're thinking about having a knee replacement, or they're at different stages of of, of you know getting ready for for that operation. So. Starting with the first question, and this is one that you know, many people who have started looking into what it means to have a new replacement will have come across, I'm sure, and that's this idea of there being different types and not just different types of implants, but crucially, sort of maybe two main ways of going about the knee replacement. And sometimes it can be a bit confusing because they may be referred to interchangeably as knee replacement, but within that there is the total knee replacement or sort of the the, the earlier version, if you will, the original knee replacement, and then the partial knee replacement. And can you tell us a bit about the, the difference between those two and, and, and what each one is trying to achieve and, and so on? Yeah, so osteoarthritis of the knee affects patients differently. Um, and it may be that the knee is affected by osteoarthritis throughout. So we regard the knee as being in essentially three compartments, the joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone, the patellofemoral joint, and then the joint between the thigh bone and the leg bone between the femur and the tibia, which itself is in two parts. That's on the inner side or the medial side. So that would be the left-hand side of your right knee or the lateral side, which would be the right-hand side of your right knee. So we have three parts of the knee and it may well be that in some patients, Osteoarthritis only affects one part rather than all three parts of the knee. And rather than at the time of surgery, replacing two thirds of the knee, which is actually functioning quite well and is not the cause for any pain, then why do that? Why not just resurface or replace that part that's in trouble? With, uh, you, by doing that, you are also maintaining far more of the soft tissues around the knee, such as all the ligaments in the knee, uh, and it, it's a, a lesser exposure of the knee joint as well. So we'll come to the advantages and disadvantages in a bit, I'm sure. Um, but that's basically what a partial knee replacement is. With a total knee replacement, you're resurfacing all of the surfaces of the knee, the bit between the thigh bone and the kneecap, and between the thigh bone and the leg bone, the tibiofemoral joint. There is this sort of concept, somehow, I think when you say a total knee replacement, that some patients have the idea that you're just chopping out the entire knee and putting some of the sort of large hinge device in. Uh, but even with a total knee replacement, what you're doing is still essentially resurfacing the knee and most of the ligaments are still going to be functioning and all of the muscles and tendons around the knee will be functioning normally. 
uh, but it is undoubtedly a bigger operation having a total knee replacement than a partial knee replacement. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, I guess what, what, while that isn't the name, the, 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 that is indeed also what, you know, what, what is the, the key difference. But also, as you say, with each one, it's about you know, being as non-invasive as possible, about as, as changing as little of the original anatomy as possible and trying to achieve something that is as close to the original anatomy as possible as well. Uh, but of course, you know, as, as the saying often is, you know, there's nothing better than the, than the original knee, but, uh, but you know, yeah. as, as, as we know, great effects can be achieved with, with each of these. Now, so the partial knee replacement is a bit more of a recent, uh, recent innovation, but it's still been around for quite some time. How, how... Yeah, the, the, the knee replacement, which uh, many of us use most commonly, is the Oxford partial knee replacement, which is specifically designed predominantly for the medial compartment of the knee, though it can be used laterally. It doesn't play any part in the kneecap joint, the patellofemoral joint. And that has been around for many years, for many, many years, at least 30 years, and uh, has a, a good track record. With all these things, uh, the design changes incrementally and the surgical technique will change a little bit as you go along, but it's still fundamentally the same concept. So. The original partial knee replacement is still used now. It works very well, got an excellent track record, but there have been quite a few more recent designs uh, of partial knee replacements, which are now uh, being used. So one of the questions for a patient really would be not just should I have a total or should I have a partial, but which sort of partial knee replacement should I have? Yeah, what are the advantages and disadvantages? So it is quite a complicated picture. That is indeed. indeed. And from from a sort of the, the the personal point of view, as you know, if it, as uh, if if I was someone who was in the position where um, I'm I'm struggling with knee arthritis, I've been advised that I'm, that it's going to need surgery. Is there any way that I would be able to know in myself that perhaps I I might be more likely to 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 be eligible for for a, a partial knee replacement or or not? Is there or or is it all based on the X-ray and 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 sort of the the examination in the, in the, in the clinic. Right. So it's quite a complex decision-making process. So for the, for the patient themselves, it is really with the pain is well localized to one part of the knee. You know, if if you feel pain all around the knee and every activity reproduces that pain, then it's more likely that it's going to be a total knee replacement. But if it's very well localized, just to say the the left hand side of your right knee and that's the only place that you get your symptoms, all of the problems are, are minimal, then it may well be that a partial knee replacement would be the right way forward. But the decision whether to do it or not depends on many factors. So not just the symptoms, um, the history of how the arthritis developed, the uh, activities that increase pain, uh, so, for example, if you really struggle with going up or down slopes and hills, mm -hmm. then that tends to point you towards the kneecap part of the knee being a main card part of the problem. Okay. Um, and then the examination of the knee as well by the surgeon is absolutely key. So in certain circumstances, you may just have arthritis of that one part of your knee, the medial compartment. But if you can't straighten the knee out, if you have, say, a fixed flexion deformity, mm -hmm. then that will not be corrected by doing a partial replacement. It probably won't work. If you've got a bow leg or a knock knee deformity that is significant, more than 10 degrees, say, or even really more than five degrees, and it just cannot be corrected, then again, it's more likely that a total knee replacement would be appropriate. Okay. Uh, and if there's been ligament damage, so, you know, if you're a previous footballer or something like that, and you've, you've had an anterior cruciate rupture at some time in the past, which has never been reconstructed, you've had some cartilage taken out, so you've developed arthritis of your knee, but you've still got an element of instability, mm -hmm. then again, it's unlikely that a partial knee replacement will be appropriate for you. Right, okay. okay. And, and, and overall of, of, of everyone you see with severe knee arthritis how what's roughly what proportion would you know were, were, for, for roughly for roughly what proportion would a partial knee replacement be, be appropriate yeah so this varies a little bit on surgeon experience and practice as well 
Uh, so this won't apply to everybody, but in my practice, I have a particular interest in arthritis in younger patients. Mm -hmm. um, and in that group, again, you'd be more likely looking at trying to do a partial replacement rather than a total if possible, uh, because of the better level of function you get. And I'm sure we'll come to that shortly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in my own practice, it's probably about 30, 40 percent of patients who have knee replacements will have a partial knee replacement. Okay. Very few patients are actually suitable for the partial replacement that just does the patellofemoral joint, the kneecap joint. That is very small numbers. Um, in my own practice, it's probably only three or four percent. Right. Okay. Uh, and that's even with an interest in doing partial knee replacement. So uh, those are relatively few and far between. But for the medial side of the knee, particularly, uh, then it's around about 30% in my practice. And, and I guess it's worth saying, as, as, uh, as you mentioned, your, your practice focuses a bit on, on, on sort of younger people with, with arthritis. So, so by and large across the country, there'll be uh, probably a smaller proportion still who will be having the partial knee replacements as compared yeah. to the, yeah. the total. Yeah, absolutely right, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so, so we, we've sort of touched on there being certain advantages and, and disadvantages of, of, of either approach. Could you help guide us through some of those? Yeah, so I think if we look at the, the advantages of a partial knee replacement, we've already mentioned to some extent. So it, it's a less invasive procedure, so it'll be a shorter scar, less soft tissues will be uh, sort of have to be dissected through to be able to do the implant. Um, the, there are various effects of that. It's not just the amount of maybe post-operative discomfort you get, but your early recovery will be quicker. And it's more likely with partial knee replacements that you can actually have it done as a day case. So this is increasing part of practice now is doing partial knee replacements as day case procedures. Uh, it can be a bit confusing because there are various definitions of what you mean by day case. Uh, so in UK practice, that means coming in the morning, having your operation done and then going home in the evening, whereas American day case is usually 23 hours. So you sort of allowed one night overnight, but you've got to go home an hour before you came in. Yeah. So it, uh, it's just a little bit different. But I'm, I'm meaning the British or UK and European definition of day case, which is coming in and out within the day. Uh, and that is now possible uh, and it's probably going to be applicable to, to about 60% of patients who are having partial knee replacements. The aim now would be to be able to do that. Uh, and that's going to be an increasing uh, way of delivering this service, particularly following the COVID pandemic when inpatient beds are difficult to come by. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it seems that uh, that will be a step towards addressing you know, the waiting list, trying to limit time in hospital and, you know, getting some support out there too. To yeah. But of course it will also rely on people you know, feeling informed and empowered and supported okay. both before and afterwards with spending less time in hospital and more time recovering at home. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine envisage that it would worry people, uh, patients who are told, well, you're going to go home after you've had a knee replacement that day. You, you have to understand exactly what it will involve and what support's going to be available. I, would, I certainly want to, wouldn't want to worry people into thinking that uh, they will have to have their knee replacement done as a day case. That's not the case at all. Uh, I've got to make sure you fit well and, and have all the social support when you go home to be able to cope with it. Yeah. So that, that's one of the advantages is the, the, the sort of rapid turnaround, if you like, and returning back to normal. Recovery overall will be quicker with a partial knee replacement or should be quicker. So um, I would, would normally say that you, know, you should be rid of any uh, walking aids for a total knee replacement easily by six weeks. Mm -hmm. But with a partial knee replacement, many patients don't need them at all or abandon them within a few days of, of going home. So the rehabilitation is quicker. You're going to be able to get back to activities like driving, walking, uh, up and down stairs, returning to normal activities will be quicker with a partial knee replacement. But I think with a, with a successful partial knee replacement, the, the real thing we're aiming for uh, is what gets referred to as a forgotten knee. So you've, you've had your knee replacement done and you feel that essentially you're almost pretty much back to having a normal knee joint. Whereas with a total knee replacement, you're more likely to say, yes, well, I'm much better than I was before, but I've had a knee replacement and this knee replacement feels fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had a partial replacement, you're more likely to say, this knee feels fine. Mm 
yeah. And I think that's that's a, a subtle, maybe a subtle difference, but a very important one. Yeah, absolutely. So you're going to be able to do more things like kneel on it without thinking about it, mm -hmm. uh, and return to higher levels of activity, such as uh, certainly doubles tennis. That sort of level of activity should be achievable with a partial knee replacement. And I've had some. Uh, with patellofemoral replacements, where you just do that kneecap part of the knee, have got actually got back to running, even running 10k. So you know, quite a significant level of activity. With a medial or lateral partial, you're unlikely to get to do that though, as, uh, because you lost the sort of shock absorber in your knee. Yeah, and, and that, that is a very very common question that we see is around what are the limitations around what I can safely do. Uh, after, yeah. Be that after a partial or 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 after a total knee replacement. Now, what, what do do you set any? Are, are are there any sort of strict strict rules around that? Right, I, I don't think there are. So the if you've had a knee replacement, there is no point then sitting at home wrapping it in cotton wool and doing nothing with it. The whole point of having a knee replacement is quality of life. So, you know, the, the, we want people to get back out there and enjoy doing the things they want to do. Uh, so activities such as cycling, swimming, even for partial or total knee replacements uh, should be doable. And uh, you know, there's always going to be this worry about, am I going to wear my knee out by, by doing this? Uh, and yes, you know, if you're a really heavy user, then it may start to wear a little bit quicker. Um, but uh, I think that's it's something to be discussed as part of the consultation when you're talking to your surgeon. You know, if I do this, what what are the downsides? But I would never say to anyone, no, you mustn't. No. Um, but that that you know, there used to be questions such as uh, after partial or total knee replacements. Should I go skiing again? Yeah. Um, and yes, you've got a risk. If you have a really bad injury after you've had a knee replacement done, and for example, you get a bone fracture just above or below where the knee replacement is, it's very difficult to manage. But how often does that happen? Phenomenally rarely. Mm -hmm. So for goodness sake, if you've had a knee replacement so you can go skiing again, then go skiing again. That's, that's the whole point. Enjoy life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that, and 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 and, that, and that's the the crucial thing that it's such a such an effective operation at improving quality of life and enabling people to get back to their previous hobbies and activities. But yeah. perhaps not always starting a new uh, a new uh, you know high high impact activity or hobby. No, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, quite. Uh, and 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 so particularly in, in your practice, where you see uh, younger people with knee arthritis, you're doing perhaps more, or you, you're doing more partial knee replacements than um, than the, than sort of the, the the typical average across the country. There is then some considerations around, you know, as you touched on wearing the implant out or needing another operation further down the line and. How, how, how do those conversations go? Because then on, on the one hand, I guess there's, you're balancing, well, should I, should I wait another five years and put up with pain and swelling and not really being able to do things? Or should I have the surgery now, but then maybe need to have some other operation further down the line? Yeah. So I think the first decision that you have to make is that are my symptoms bad enough to warrant a knee replacement? So that's got to be the bottom line. And you know, a knee replacement is surgery. It's got risks as well as benefits, whatever type of knee replacement you do. Yeah. So decision one is, am I bad enough to need a knee replacement? And the surgeon should guide you through that and give a realistic appraisal of risks and benefits. Yeah. The second decision then is what sort of knee replacement should I have? So is it then suitable for a partial or a total knee replacement? So that's the order it has to go. There is undoubtedly the risk if you are suitable for a partial knee replacement, but you leave it and leave it and leave it, then it may get to the point where it, that option has gone. So the deformity is increased, the knee has got stiffer, you no longer match the clinical criteria for having a partial knee replacement, so you're committed to a total knee replacement. But usually the symptoms are bad enough to warrant intervening. So that, that situation is normally unusual. But again, coming back to the impact of COVID as waiting lists have gone up and up, this is actually becoming a, a problem. And I've, certainly in my clinic now, I've seen a few patients who had been listed for a partial knee replacement 
uh, 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, who are coming back for review now as we're getting things up and running again, but the deformity has now increased or the arthritis has spread to other parts of the knee. Okay. Well, and so we've touched on some of the limitations of partial and total, and we've touched on some of the advantages. Um, now, we, you mentioned as well that there are risks and, of course, disadvantages with, with, with any procedure. And I guess that's one of the, one of the conversations that, that, that no one who is getting, you know, getting ready or considering the operation wants to have, but it's perhaps one of the most important ones. Um, and yeah. how, how do you go about you know, those you know, going over that, that, that topic? Yeah, so the, the key thing that we're coming to now is how long does a, a knee replacement last for to some extent? Yeah. Um, and if a knee replacement fails, then it can be redone. So that will be referred to as a revision knee replacement. And we have a lot of data now from what's called the National Joint Registry. So every time a knee replacement or a hip replacement or other joint replacements are done, then data is collected with the patient's permission uh, and followed up. And so we know when any knee replacement has been done when it is revised so we have good figures about revision rates and there is no doubt that the revision rate for a partial knee replacement is higher than it is for a total knee replacement so although the partial knee replacement has big advantages in terms of speedy recovery and lower complications such as heart attacks, bleeding, blood clots, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, which are a lot more rare and unusual with a partial knee replacement and infection, which is one of the, the most worrisome complications, again, is lower with a partial knee replacement. But overall, the revision rate is higher. So you're more likely to need to have your partial replacement redone than you are having to have a total knee replacement. And we're, we're not talking about early. This is, you know, overall sort of 10, 15 years down the line. If you look at the figures, then you're probably three, maybe four times more likely to have had to have your partial knee replacement revised. But the uh, advantages for most patients far outweighs that. And the reason why it may need revision for a partial replacement, really two reasons. One is progression of arthritis elsewhere in the knee. So we have only replaced one part of the knee, one third of it, there's still two thirds which can develop osteoarthritis. Um, and if that occurs, then it's a relatively straightforward uh, procedure to convert the partial into a total knee replacement. You don't have to put in uh, a particular complex type of knee replacement to salvage this. The other reason why a partial knee replacement may need revising is because the implant itself is starting to fail, either through loosening or wear of the components. Uh, so again, it's usually fairly straightforward to convert it to a total knee replacement. If, however, you've had a total knee replacement and that starts to wear or loosen, then it's a much, much bigger operation to revise that to a revision type of total knee replacement which is much more major surgery and is much less likely to give you a good outcome at the end as well. Yeah. Yeah. So this again, it's a conversation you need to have with your surgeon about risks and benefits. But overall, in the right situation, a, a partial knee replacement, it, in my opinion, far outperforms a total knee replacement and with acceptable or lower risks that go with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the, the National Joint Registry and and, and understanding you know, the, the, the success of a treatment for both for how that helps with the individual, but also you know, in the grander scale and, and the bigger picture. And, and I would urge anyone watching this, whatever operation you're having, to make sure that you complete the surveys, these uh, patient reported outcome measures that you will be given from the team that play a really, really crucial role in sort of setting a baseline of understanding of how your symptoms are impacting your quality of life before the operation, and then at some key stages afterwards. And that can really help both you and your team to understand your individual progress, but it also helps you know, the wider community to, you know, to monitor and improve uh, the, the, the treatment of, uh, of knee arthritis. And you know, for, for, for your patients, Prof. Prof Turner, you know, that, that can be done via the My Recovery app, for instance. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and, if, and if you're watching this video and, and, and you have a copy of a, 
Professor Turner is up, you will see these surveys pop up at a few key checkpoints uh, on that journey to, to, to recovery. Yeah, I, I absolutely support that actually. It's very important that we know how our patients are doing, how the knee replacements are doing, but also that feedback comes back to how your surgeon is doing. So, you know, it's feedback for us to, to how well uh, patients are doing following the surgery. Do we need to change practice in some way? Is an implant of some sort not functioning as well as a different implant? Uh, surgical techniques vary. It's all feedback that we need. And in UK practice, we've been very lucky to have collected this type of data for a long time. So we're actually world leaders uh, in looking at you know, uh, outcomes following joint replacement that puts us in a very strong position. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that really does help to guide uh, you know, these conversations, but more importantly, the decision-making process for each individual case, weighing up the risks and the benefits, some of which we've touched on, and also trying to identify what is the most appropriate procedure and also what is the most appropriate implant. Uh, yeah, for absolutely. Person. Correct. Uh, for someone watching this, there's questions around <clears throat> the, the different implants that might be used. Uh, how, how, is, how is that measured? How, how, how would you sort of go about addressing those kind of questions around you know, what, what, what will be used in my particular case and, uh, and so on? Yeah, so going, going beyond the discussion about partial or total knee replacement, then there are many other designs of knee replacement that are available. And the, the advantages and disadvantages are, are pretty, pretty fine about which ones are better. And a lot of it is theoretical. So it comes from what you think is going to be a better design because it looks as though it should function better than an older design. But what really matters is getting the data that you talked about, Axel, uh, and looking at the real world of whether it actually does last longer or produce better results. And most surgeons will have a particular implant which they use on a regular basis. Uh, and I think that's the key thing is to, you know, ask your surgeon, what implant do you use? Is this an implant that's got a good track record? Has it got a good history? And is it something you've used and you're comfortable with for a long time? And most surgeons will say, yes, this is an implant I've used. And that's what gives you consistent results is the surgeon doing the same operation the same way time after time after time and that's what gives you the good outcomes yeah, absolutely absolutely and another consideration that 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 we often see questions around is i guess another uh, another factor in in uh, in putting together uh, you know this the, the the new knee and that's whether the implant is fixed into the bone with cement or without cement yeah okay so the when you have a, a, a knee replacement put into your knee, it's got to stick to the bone, all right? So there's no point having something loose inside the knee. And there are two fundamental ways of doing that. If the in implant is really made out of metal um, and that somehow has to become adherent to the bone itself so it doesn't move and not just for a short period of time, but for many years. So we're talking 15, 20, maybe more years that it's got to be firmly adherent to the bone. So there are two ways of doing it. One is to use a very thin layer of cement, uh, which really acts more like a grout rather than a glue. It makes it a very tight fit to the bone and the bone grows in around that cement uh, and holds it. The other option is to use a surface coating on the metal, uh, which uh, again, is sort of two, two aspects to it. One that it is quite rough so that the, again it sort of sticks and jams against the bone but it also encourages bony ingrowth either from the shape or from the chemicals that it's sprayed with basically calcium salts which are on the surface that encourage bony ingrowth. Uh, the, the advantage of the uh, cementless or uncemented implant is to some extent speed so you don't have to wait for cement to set while you while you're doing this so the operation may be 10, 15 minutes shorter by doing that, but for a patient, that's probably neither here nor there. Um, but what really matters is, is it gonna stay stuck? And in the past, the, the cement seemed to win compared to the cement less, but technology has come on and now it's changed. And there again now is an increasing look 
at cementless implants and i think this side of it is going to grow okay uh, there are occasional adverse reactions to cement for example when it's put in uh, mm -hmm. so to avoid that is is useful but we will become we're collecting the figures uh, we, we as we've discussed we have the systems in place and now to to see whether the cementless implants are safe and that they will stay uh, firmly fixed to bone yeah, um, yeah. for example for in my practice the partial knee replacements i do now are virtually all cement less because i'm convinced that the outcome of cementless partial knee replacements is as good as if not better than with cemented partial knee replacements for total knee replacements the evidence isn't probably as strong yet so i'm still using cemented total knee replacement okay fascinating well thanks for that and i guess that then you know, we've, we've we've touched on a you know that that will feed into the longevity of the implant and, and, and how long it lasts for and, and, and you've mentioned you know 15 20 years you know but when, when someone comes to you and says well yeah how, how long will my knee replacement last and also what can i do to make it last as long as possible what should i avoid to make it last as long as possible and i guess also as a patient w would i know that my knee replacement has, has started to wear out or that i might need a new one yeah all, all really good questions. So the, my, my sort of stock answer to how long a knee replacement will last used to be uh, that if I have my knee replacement done, 19 out of 20 will still be working perfectly well, 95% at 10 years, 90%, 9 out of 10 will still be functioning well at 15 years. That's probably pessimistic now, and I think it'll probably last longer than that. What you can never say to an individual patient is your knee replacement is going to last this length of time. It's a matter of risk, really. So the, the other question that, that you asked is, how will I know mm. that it's starting to fail? Um, and it, it's something that generally comes on quite slowly over a period of time. And the, the usual cause for failure is loosening. But that loosening is secondary to wear of the plastic component inside the knee. So the plastic bit, which is really a type of polyethylene, wears very, very slowly. It produces microscopic pieces of plastic that work their way around the knee mm -hmm. and ultimately produce a sort of inflammatory response around the knee. So the first thing you may notice is it starts to swell. Mm -hmm. It starts to get a bit more uncomfortable. And then when you start to get actual loosening of the implant, it's a very specific sort of discomfort that it hurts when you first stand on it. So when you first get up out of bed in the morning, it hurts when you first take a few steps or if you've been sat down, the first few steps are painful. <clears throat> then eventually the knee starts to really swell up a lot more and become more painful and a, even a recurrence of deformity. Right. So, but it, it usually comes upon you and, you know, the, as a slow, slow, slow change, and in the past, we've, we've put in place regular review. So patients come for x-rays at a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years. But it's so unpredictable whether that x-ray is actually going to pick up anything that really matters. Many places are actually starting to abandon that now and really leaving it up to the development of symptoms. But it's an area that we're actually actively looking at whether you could just be requested to have an x-ray done at a certain period of time and not even have a surgeon or radiologist review the x-ray, but have an automatic reporting system for it that would pick out those first changes on an x-ray that would indicate loosening may be happening or where may be happening even before you get symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, this, is, this is research in progress at the moment. And, and I guess it's another example of a field where tracking your own symptoms over time, be that uh, by, by a, an app such as your, your My Recovery app, or if that's jotting things down and just, or just seeing how, how your activity changes over time, that might also help to feed into the, so this conversation, the decision making, or oh, should I go and, and get this checked out? And, and how am I doing now compared with before surgery, in the first year, in the second year, and so on? Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, if five or six years down the line, for some reason, uh, the patient's sort of getting unhappy or concerned about it, then nobody is going to be worried about that patient asking for a referral back for review. You know, the, the surgeon is going to be as interested as the patient is on oh, yeah. what's happening to that knee replacement that he or she did years ago. You know, yeah. we, want, we want to know. We want yeah, to know. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have a concern, if you have a question about your knee, you know, 
whatever stage you are in, in you know, on that road to recovery, your team will want to know about it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, Prof, before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add to, you know, to sprinkle some of the, some of your wealth of experience onto these topics? I know there is so much more we could dig into, so much more we could discuss, but I think we'll have to do that in, in, in another session. There is There's so much to talk about, Axel. I think we mentioned before robotics is the next one. That's worth a, worth a whole whole hour's conversation on its own. So that's a very easily, if not more, <laughs> developing. And uh, just to add in as well about the My Recovery app, just how valuable that is for surgeons as well. So real time, I can review how my patients are doing. Um, I get patient feedback on patient experience. This is so important for making sure that the, the service that I offer for the patients is the best I can possibly do. And I think every surgeon would want that. So right. it's been a terrific, uh, terrific progress for me to, to use the My Recovery app. It's been great, right. Axel. Hey, but th thank you so much for that. That's great to hear. And I know our team of developers and everyone else will be delighted to hear that, you know, the, the stuff that we're doing here in the office is having a real world impact out there and helping. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Super. Well, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We'll be uh, back before too long again with another session. As ever, if you have a question or if you have a suggestion for a topic, send it in and we'll get to it. Until then, be safe and keep up the good work, everyone. Take care. Hey.